Okay, everyone, welcome back. So we're, we're going to uh, dive into some of the case studies. And the first case study is on, uh, on tuberculosis and the perpetuation of health policy double standards. And we're going to look at, the, at, at, at latent TB. And we've divided this into three parts. I'm going to lay out some of the background uh, of the case, uh, kind of the, the medical part of it. And uh, then we will have um, Christian McMillan talk about cost effectiveness and really talk about TB, bring in the example of water and the institutionalization of health economics. And then we'll have Tom Nicholson and Catherine Adme talk about uh, the WHO and its responsibilities uh, under gr global treaties and really how this all relates to our question of accountability. So the, uh, I, I just, because I realize everybody in this room probably isn't up to date on the latest on tuberculosis. It actually doesn't change, so if you actually knew it from 10 years ago, you would be sort of up to date, but uh, I'll just go through it anyway. About 10 million people get TB every year, and we actually only discover 6.1 million people using the methods available to us, and, uh, uh, or the methods that are recommended. And uh, so 4.3 million people are not identified. It's a big problem, obviously, because it's an airborne disease. It affects the poor people who live in crowded living conditions. If they're, if they're not identified and treated, they spread it in their families and communities. Now, there's, there's drug-resistant forms of the disease. There, there have been for, for many, many years. Uh, there are about 600,000 people who have strains resistant to the, to the medicines that have been uh, prescribed by the World Health Organization and other international bodies. Uh, only 60,000 of them get treatment. About one million children get the disease every year. Only one third of them are actually found and, and, uh, and uh, uh, potentially treated. They're diagnosed and some of them are treated. So it should come as no surprise that even though we've had a cure for TB since 1948, uh, about two million people die every year. Children, uh, people with drug resistance, et cetera. HIV is actually the biggest killer of people with, sorry, TB is the biggest killer of people with HIV. So it works synergistically with HIV for various reasons. The TB bug upregulates certain receptors that make it easier for HIV to infect cells. HIV blocks the function of certain cells that make it easier to get TB. And so you, they work very synergistically with each other. So this is the biggest killer of people with HIV. Now, you'd imagine that if we've had a cure since 1948, uh, rates of TB would be dropping quite rapidly globally. This is the global rates of TB. They're, it's roughly about 120 per 100,000 right now. The, case, the, the rate in the US is about 2.9 per 100,000. So globally, it's about 120 per 100,000. And it declines 1.5% per year. So it's, it's obviously a very glacial uh, decline. And, and, and as I told you, it kills a lot of people with HIV still. So if you start to look at the US rate, which is roughly 3 per 100,000, and you look at the global rate, which is 120 per 100,000, and you map it out that we're going down at 1.5% per year, if we continue at the current pace, it'll take 200 years for the global rate to reach the US rate. So obviously, that, that's not a good thing. So why haven't we been able to stop this epidemic globally? So the, 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 the answer to this is quite, quite complex. And uh, you know, Christian McMillan will go a little bit into this. But let me just give you some background on the disease, and then just kind of build up to answer that question. So, this is a bacterial disease that, that, you know, the bug for which was identified by Robert Koch in 1882. So it's not like, you know, we don't know exactly what causes it. And, you know, people have known even before then the, the, you know, that, that uh, closed, prolonged exposure to untreated people, et cetera, can, you know, can, can cause the disease. And a, a, the first drug to combat tuberculosis, so be, between Koch's discovery of it and, of course, you know, TB's been around for, for arguably thousands of years before then, you know, people were, you know, after Coke, people were put in sanatoria and other things to separate them, even before Coke, actually, in the 19th century. But in the 20th century, you get this amazing discovery. Uh, in 1943, streptomycin is isolated from soil in the laboratory of Salman Waxman at uh, Rutgers University. And he sends it to colleagues at, uh, I believe, Merck, and the, you know, they purify it, and it's put into a patient, and it's shown that it can cure them. So really, as early as 1944, you know that it can be, be cured. And um, uh, they noticed that, that if you, uh, the, first, the first clinical trial, actually, is done by the British Medical Research Council on uh, streptomycin. I think they give it to about 100 people. And they get cured. Most of them get cured. But 
a number of them relapse. So they realize that if you use one drug, you get drug resistance. And it really opens up, you know, this, this TB is the disease where you have uh, so much of, of our current medical approaches, you know, beginning, uh, the, the, our approaches begin from the way we've looked and viewed TB, from clinical trials to, to you know, a lot of drug discovery. So, you know, it, it, this, is, this is the problem that has plagued, you know, humankind to you, at least throughout the 19th and 20th centuries in large numbers that have been quantified. And um, early 20th century, you have it being linked to a lot of movements, you know, uh, nationalist movements. The Bolsheviks wanted to get rid of it. Ataturk wanted to get rid of it. You've got, you know, you've got uh, uh, movements in almost every country from Denmark to Canada, you know, these anti-TB associations. It's a big part of the nation state. It's a big part of modernity. So no surprise after streptomycin, you have uh, the identification and creation of a number of other drugs that are anti-TB drugs. So really by the end of the 1940s, people know that you get drug resistance, people know that you can use a combination therapy, and you know, some, some very important observations are, are, uh, arise that help us stop TB. So for, as far as drug resistance, streptomycin causes it, you give it with another drug, paraminosalicylic acid, you don't get it. Isoniazid is invented. They try to give it alone. Isoniazid is used for TB. It was invented earlier. They uh, try to give it with. Uh, they try to give it alone. It cures people. You see drug resistance. They give it with streptomycin and a new and paraminosalicylic acid. You don't see it. You see very high cure rates. So everyone figures out you have to give multiple drugs to people. People figure out that very early on, the British Medical Research Council does a survey in England looking at drug resistance. Interestingly, I think it's around 1955, and. Uh, the, uh, they find that there is drug resistance to these new drugs that have just been invented. So, and, and the suggestion is primary drug resistance. So they go to people who have never been treated, and they, they you know, take their strains, and they find drug resistance. So they realize that drug resistance strains can pass from person to person. And you, know, you see this in the United States. So you know, the idea is that you really want to, to uh, you, drug resistance is a bad thing. It's really going to be passed on. There's a number of studies on it in the 50s and 60s looking at you know, what happens if you treat somebody or if you don't treat them, do you stop transmission? And of course, you know, if you treat somebody, if they're untreated, you get 100% transmission to guinea pigs you know, who are in a little chamber above where the patient is. And if you actually treat them, you get almost 0% transmission to the guinea pig chamber. So there's a lot of scientific studies that are supporting that you have to get people on treatment really quickly so that you don't have transmission of the disease. And then, People have noticed that if you um, treat people and you screen their relatives using x-rays, which were, of course, invented in 1895, if you screen them and you give x-rays, you, you notice that maybe six months later or a year later, some of their family members get it, even though you, you've treated the index case. So they realized that there was some sort of like something they were calling latent TB that existed. And the United States Public Health Service in the 1950s uh, goes into Alaska. And they, you know, they create a treatment program in hospitals and then in the community, and they notice that people's families are still getting infected. And they do a study. They say, what if we gave these people who we think have this dormant form of the disease, isoniazid, the single drug, will they get better? And they find out that, you know, will they, will they get the disease? And they find out that they don't. And they, they not only find out that, but they find out that rates of TB, which are very, very high, drop rapidly. This is not, these are not rates of TB on this graphic. This is a, a graphic of infection inside households, which is a proxy for transmission. But they show that transmission, if you, if you treat the disease and you give this dormant form treatment, you get this massive drop. So there's a lot of principles that emerge really, really quickly. And these principles are put into practice uh, in, you know, that, that in Western countries immediately. Search for newly infected people. Get people on therapy quickly. Give them the most effective therapy so that they become non-infectious. Help them take the medicines, because you have to take it for a long time. In those days, it was 18 months. And treat all the contacts that have the disease with this kind of prophylaxis so that they don't get sick. This stuff is known. So by, the, by, the, by 1962, this is the norm. This is the standard of care in Western countries. And, you, you, uh, uh, and then a couple of things happen. And I think you know I, I, I really appreciate the conversation that, that happened yesterday because I think the couple of things that happen uh, are really at this at this uh, uh, the intersection of you know as we discussed yesterday colonialism and 
and neoliberalism. And you have, and Christian will talk more about this, I think, or maybe not in this specific talk, but he's written about this, that you know, as early as the 1950s, when we've known that eisenazid monotherapy is a problem, the British are recommending eisenazid monotherapy for the colonies. And you know, the, the, I mean, you write, you, I, I, I hope I'm not stealing any of your thunder, but you know, in your book, you, you, put, you put it so beautifully that even the British doctors uh, in Kenya are just horrified that there would be this suggestion because it just doesn't make scientific sense and it's going to lead to more, more, um, um, you know, more resistance. And, and then neoliberalism comes in, and I want to talk about that in a, you know, a little bit more. So both speakers yesterday brought, you know, brought up the fact of selective primary health care. So you have this kind of this feeling in the 1950s and 60s. You know, there is talk about cost, and even the, the debates about whether to give uh, people full care or not, or use eisenazid monotherapy, are around the fact that, well, you know, it's better to just give one drug than nothing. And essentially, that you know, these guys can't afford more than the one drug, so you know, let's just do that. Um, you get the call for health for all in 1978. And by 1979, uh, uh, you, you have Kenneth Warren, who's the head of the Rockefeller Foundation, convening people you know, around that period, talking about convening people uh, at Bellagio uh, to talk about, you know, can you actually do primary health care, you know, given the, the, the financial circumstances in the world and other things. And they come out with this paper, which we saw yesterday. I think Randy showed it to us on you know, selective primary health care, an interim strategy for disease control in developing countries. And for TB, this paper is is monumental because really in their plan they rate they rate some uh, priorities right high priorities like diarrhea measles etc and you heard yesterday that Jim Grant from UNICEF was you know brought on board to support this because there were a lot of things that you could you could give you know shots and other things for and it really fit well with these single interventions that you could do but for tuberculosis they recommended not treating it because they said that it was kind of like a you know, it was it was a medium priority, and they in fact said that you know you, you can best deal with this disease and uh, sleeping sickness and chagas and other things uh, through more research, and really not to focus on it. And you know, it it, it led to this kind of uh, relegation of TB to kind of you know a, a second tier, and and funders weren't funding it. So you have you know again I'm I'm putting 50 years of history together, but you 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 have. Uh, you know, the, a debate going on in the 1980s among, in the TB community. People are doing studies and showing how you can lower prices. Drugs like rifampicin, which are part of the backbone of treating it, go off patent. And Chris Murray, who you heard about yesterday, uh, you know, developed the disability adjusted life year uh, uh, instrument. Uh, uh, he has been working, he turned out to be friends and working with Carl Stieblow, who was one of the coll colleagues that worked on TB control. Carl Stieblow had taken this whole package of giving uh, these antibiotics that treat TB to community health workers in East Africa, uh, you know, and not involving doctors, and, and really creating the equivalent of a shot. You know, you 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 go to these people's houses, you give them their medicines, you go every day for six months because it takes a long time to treat it, but that you can actually uh, cure it, uh, and and it doesn't cost that much. So he's in dialogue with Chris Murray. And Chris Murray's working on the world, working with the World Health Organization and the World Bank on the World Development Report for 1993, and basically, treatment of TB enters this report as one of the most cost-effective uh, interventions. And uh, you know, the uh, and then WHO, being part of this, you know, jumps onto this and says, well. Uh, we are going to, uh, you know, run with this. We now have this intervention that fits perfectly in the primary healthcare slash selective primary healthcare paradigm, and they declare an emergency. They, 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 in 1993, they say there's eight to nine million cases of TB a year, and they actually say one third of the world's population is infected with it. Right? Those, the, the people that, that Comstock and these guys in Alaska were treating, they say one third of the people in the world are infected with this latent TB. And, and therefore, this is a global emergency, and we're going to create a thing called DOTS, Direct Observe Therapy Short Course. Those were the four drugs that you have to take for six months. It's not really that short, but shorter than what it was. So Direct Observe Therapy Short Course. And so they, 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 they create this campaign. And you know they're under a lot of pressure from the World Bank and other people to make this very cost effective. And so they, they, they create this as a very simple program. They ask countries to have political commitment, 
diagnosis with sputum smear microscopy, standardized short course chemotherapy, a regular supply of high quality drugs, and then standardized recording and reporting so that they can follow along. So it's really simple, easy, low cost. It totally fits, you know, more or less within the selective primary healthcare paradigm. A paradigm where you go in, you do an intervention, you're not investing in building health systems, you're not doing anything like that that would upset the financial apple cart. You're just, you know, you're doing what you need to to, to, to save some lives. Now, uh, this of course is a very minimalist intervention. Uh, it doesn't, you know, TB is airborne, I told you, and this doesn't focus at all on transmission or infection control. There's no, you know, just to use today's lingo, there's no emphasis on health system strengthening. This is about creating a vertical program like what Selective Primary Healthcare was talking about, really the equivalent of going and giving an injection. They, they immediately, even though drug resistance had been seen from the first time a drug was used, this system said, you know, we're just gonna give a package of, of first line drugs and we're gonna forget about drug resistance because it's really not that important. And it was kind of a one size fits all. So some people have TB that's in their lungs, some have TB in other parts of their body, this wasn't gonna focus on that. This also didn't focus on, um, on active case detection. They said, you know what, we're just gonna wait for people who are sick to come to the doctor. And when they're sick enough, we're gonna treat them. And they, they said, you know, we're, we're not going to go and deal with their families and stuff. If, if people want to, they can, but that's not going to be part of our program. They also took out this idea of latent TB. They said, you know what, we need to focus on the most infectious cases right now, and we're going to deal with latent TB uh, another time, uh, you know, later on. So we're just going to focus on this for now. And, uh, um, and then they also, you know, they, 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 used a form of diagnosis, smear microscopy, which was developed by Koch in 1882, that did not work very well on people with HIV. So remember, this is 1993, the HIV epidemic is killing thousands and thousands and thousands of people all over Africa and in other parts of the world, but in Africa particularly with TB. And so they, it, it, this mechanism that they pushed was not able to diagnose people with HIV, not able to diagnose children, not able to diagnose people with TB that's not in your lungs, and of course not able to diagnose drug resistance. So a very, very minimalist approach. Now, and you know, our group has spent a lot of time working on this, but this is just a very, you know, we focused on drug resistant TB. And here's a, a statement from the WHO in the mid 90s. It's a, it's a false statement, but MDR TB is too expensive to treat in poor countries. It detracts attention and resources from treating drug susceptible disease. And the same thing, they said if you focus on anything but smear microscopy, if you start using x rays, if you start using cell culture to figure out if somebody's got drug resistance, if you start doing latent TB treatment, you're going to detract attention from what we need to focus on, which are these most active cases that show up at the doctor coughing blood. So, you know, they, they kept it really simple. So I now want to jump, because our case is on TB infection. We, this, I've given you a whirlwind history of, of, you know, the science behind TB, and I want to give you a whirlwind history behind the science of TB infection. So this, this, this micro, you know, the, the idea of latent TB, latency is, 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 a, is a term that, that developed, but these, these bugs initially were thought to be dormant, then the term became latent, but it's really mycobacteria that are present in people, but they don't seem to have symptoms of disease. And these bugs can either, you know, go down a path where, you know, they sleep forever, as it were, or you get active disease. And 10% of people get active disease. So one in 10 people will get active disease. Now, Comstock was one of the first studies. They, you know, they did this as a randomized controlled trial, the highest life form of knowledge. And they, they, uh, they, they, you know, they showed in households that if you, if you actually uh, treated, uh, and they looked at children under three who can usually only get infections from people in their own households. And they showed that if you actually treated all the active cases and you gave this medicine, you would see this drop in transmission in households, and presumably the, the community, would drop to zero. And they saw this in a matter of five years. So you needed to have a good treatment program, a good uh, treatment program for TB infection, and you see these massive, massive drops. Remember, the rates in Alaska were 2,000 per 100,000 when Comstock started, and then they dropped markedly. And this is it over the years. These are the household infection rates. And you can see that they really, really drop rapidly, more rapidly than ever seen. And so they do this study uh, uh, in, in Bethel in Alaska. And interestingly, they even quantify that this, like of the drop that they saw, 68% of it 
was 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 linked of the risk reduction was linked to the reactivation of TB from the so-called latent. So the benefit of this of this uh, of this program of, of treating the latent disease was was technically greater than 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 active disease. So you you had to treat active in order to be able to successfully treat the latent so-called latent disease, but it actually gave more of a bang you know when you put them together. They also so. You know, people were like, "Wow, this is crazy! This is, you know, such an important finding." Comstock and his and his team followed the uh, 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 patients for 20 years, so they also found that, uh, um, uh, you know, they, as they followed people, they saw that this reduction was enduring. And here's a quote: "They said we can no longer be serious. There, there can no longer be serious doubt that the daily administration of isoniazid is effective in preventing tuberculosis under a wide variety of conditions." Then, 20 years later. They, they, they said it is probable that the effectiveness of isoniazid has been underestimated in the study because its effect went out for 20 years in a community that was still poor and had previously had such high rates of TB. Um, and then this whole idea, you know, Comstock really said these are the seedbeds of, of disease. And, and although we can't, af we can't identify who's going to be at risk, if we were to really concentrate efforts on stopping the seedbed, that's how we're going to stop the disease. And Western doctors, Western countries, anybody here who's gone to med school knows that this, this is what we learned in med school. This is what, what people did to actually stop the disease. So after Comstock, there were a number of studies. So it's not like Comstock did this study and nobody studied it again. Over time, in non-HIV infected patients, there have been 11 randomized control trials that have shown that this works. And you get a similar reduction in risk attributable reduction in risk. And subsequent to that, in the 1990s, there were, there were a number of studies of HIV-infected people. Because remember, this was the biggest killer of people with HIV. So if you could prevent people from getting infection, you could prevent death. There were 12 placebo-controlled trials that showed that this worked in people with HIV. So absolutely no doubt, no, you know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that this was the right approach to do. Now, uh, here's uh, the US guidelines from two uh, July 1999. It says, infected persons who are considered to be at high risk for developing active TB should be offered treatment of latent TB infection, irrespective of age. And can I tell you, the, the, the uh, um, Preventive Service Task Force in the United States, which for various reasons really only looks at data and not cost, has listed this as a priority intervention. So it's a really, you know, it, it, it's really, uh, um, uh, you know, it's standard of care. How much prevention is needed? Comstock even showed, you know, like so these guys were amazing, you know, for for, for their day. They they mapped out how much people could take and how much, you know, if you took just a little bit, how much reduction you got, where the inflection point was. So they said, you know, if you take any you get a benefit. If you take six months, you know, six to nine months, that's where you get a lot of benefit. They, they, they you know, over time, there were different regimens. You know, uh, uh, Comstock used isoniazid. Some people went, started using rifampicin daily for three to four months, and it worked. Some people used rifampicin and isoniazid, and it worked. There's a new drug, rifapentine, more recently, and that's worked. So, you know, the idea that, you know, there, there were even a variety of regimens. Um, the, uh, the, the, it, it, was, it, it was enduring and durable, as I told you. There was some side effects. People could get hepatotoxicity. So there was a big study in Eastern Europe done. Should you do this to people? What if they get liver problems? Well, it turns out that they took some guys who had had TB and were at high risk of getting it again, and they, they did a placebo trial, unbelievably. And they, invite, you know, they put some into a group that got eyes and eyes it, and some they just followed. And the guys that, that took... Uh, uh, that, that, that didn't get the drug had lower rates of hepatitis than the people that did, but they had this really high rate of getting TB, which increased their risk of death. So over time, there was just you know, every variation of this. People said, well, if you, if you give this drug, you're going to get so much drug resistance. And uh, there was, I think there's, there's, what is it, 13 studies that have studied, do you get drug resistance from giving this to populations? And the answer is no. So over time, every single variation and question and thing that you could say about this, that it's not going to work, it's bad, it's going to cause drug resistance, it's going to hurt people, have been studied and studied and studied and shown that it's going to work. New York City had an outbreak of drug resistance, and, and, and uh, of drug resistant TB. It had a huge outbreak of TB in the late 1980s. The rates in Harlem were over 150 per 100,000, so similar to parts of India and other places. So what did New York do? They did, I think, 
very similar to what Comstock did, but they also dealt with drug resistance. They did active case finding, treatment of all forms of TB, treatment of uh, patient supports, and treatment of so-called latent TB, TB infection for contacts. And what happened in New York? Huge drop in the TB rate, OK? So clearly, I don't need to tell this crowd that I showed you that the WHO graph that, you know, the rate dropping 1.5% per year after dots. This is what's possible. That's what's happening. And in fact, the WHO, colleagues in the WHO themselves have modeled this. <laughs> they, they have shown that if you just treat people, you get this. If you treat active and latent disease, you get this. So these are not, these are secret, you know, a secret that's unknown to people. It's unknown, it's been modeled, it's been shown repeatedly. Okay. So why has this not happened? And I'm going to let Christian go more into it. But just to give you a taste, in 1964, the WHO brought together an expert committee that said it's not feasible for poor countries. Nothing about the science. Remember, Comstock's science was impeccable. 1974, more science, more follow-up, not feasible for poor countries. They just can't do it. 1982, not feasible for poor countries. Shouldn't even be on the agenda. 1993, not part of the DOT strategy. 2015. Tom and I were, were, you know, were, were working on trying to fix some of these things. We were in Geneva, and somebody said, how oh, have you seen their latest you know, their website? And we were horrified, because on their website, it actually says, if your country is lower middle income, or if your TB rate is over 100, don't do it. We don't recommend doing it. Comstock did it when the rate was 2,000. And he's not the only one, but these guys don't recommend doing it if your rate is greater than 100, or if you're poor. How many high income countries have a rate of TB over 100? Right, so not a, not a lot of high income countries have a rate over 100, and interestingly, China and Russia have just gone below 100. So you know this number was very calibrated to have the least amount. So Tom's going to go a little bit more into that, but that is basically the rapid fire story of TB that forms the basis of this case. 